Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss the autonomy of RBI. Time to time we see the controversy on RBI. People accuse that the government, the ruling government, is taking away the autonomy of RBI. And this controversy is nothing new. Uh, from the beginning, we have seen uh, in between the controversy arises that RB, the government is interfering too much into the activities of RBI. And this controversy was there in 1960s, 70s, 80s, every, every time this controversy has existed. So today we are going to discuss what is the meaning of autonomy and uh, what is the situation around the world and uh, what is the context in India starting from uh, the setup of the RBI till today, how things have changed over time, we are going to discuss everything in details. Now if we look at the preamble of RBI, that basically gives an idea of what are the functions of the RBI, we will start with that. Now the preamble of RBI reads like this, basically to regulate the issue of bank notes and keeping of reserves with a view to securing monetary stability in India and generally to operate the currency and credit system of the country to its advantage, to have a modern monetary policy framework to meet the challenge of an increasingly complex economy to maintain price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth. So if we uh, take out the key points from the preamble, then the functions of RBI is basically to regulate the issue of banknotes and keeping the reserves and then monetary stability and then operate uh, the currency and credit system of the country and uh, then monetary policy framework and uh, price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth. So, so many object, so many functions of RBI are there and those are stated in the preamble of the Reserve Bank. Now, uh, we are going to discuss how every function can sometimes come in conflict with the autonomy. And uh, to start with, actually, we'll uh, discuss the debt management function and how that can come in conflict with the autonomy of the of the Reserve Bank, or to how that can come in conflict with the autonomy of the RBI to conduct its monetary policy, which is another objective of the, which is another function of the Reserve Bank. And uh, for example, when uh, the government uh, asks the RBI basically uh, to uh, to give loan or mobilized loan, basically you know, the government can borrow two ways, it can print money or it can ask uh, the if government, the government of India basically spends too much money and uh, the borrowing has to be done by the, uh, by the Reserve Bank, then basically for fiscal policy, on the one hand, the Reserve Bank is mobilizing more money, but at the same time, if the Reserve Bank tries to have a uh, have a tightening monetary policy or a contraction in monetary policy, then that will be conflicting upon each other. So that's how it will affect the autonomy of the Reserve Bank. Then comes the regulation and the supervision role, and uh, we will see that uh, basically uh, that uh, uh, this can actually do, be done properly in this regard. Basically, the autonomy uh, the central bank exercises is no different from the autonomy of any regulator in the financial system. So it can actually exercise its uh, regulatory supervision on the commercial banks, on the entire banking system, non-banking financial system and the cooperative banks. It can have the regulation over them, uh, just like any other regulator. Then coming to the developmental role that can uh, basically, there has to be better coordination with the government of India and then only, uh, but sometimes actually we can see that there could, uh, could be actually uh, conflict actually or that could be actually a uh, hamper in the autonomy of, uh, of the uh, Reserve Bank. But however, for development role, there has to be better coordination with the government. And uh, for creation of money, uh, again, uh, basically RBI is in charge of printing money and uh, uh, printing money can happen actually on two things. So, you know, as per the need, RBI can print money. Uh, but if the the fiscal authority or the government uh, tries to uh, basically ask the RBI governor to print money or basically to automatically monetize the deficits, then that would affect the autonomy of the Reserve Bank. 
So basically, the degrees of freedom uh, uh, the central bank has in in deciding whether or not to fund the government's expenditure out of the created money. So that the autonomy actually depends upon this. Here, if uh, RBI can say no, or RBI can put a limit that how much money can be printed to finance the deficit of the government, then that would determine the level of autonomy. But if there is no limit and automatic monetization of deficit happens, then we can say that the autonomy of the Reserve Bank is a cartel. So we should see the autonomy uh, along with the functions of the Reserve Bank. Now, when you come to the autonomy, uh, this is nothing new that is discussed now. It has been you know, in discussion from very uh, long time ago. And you see that in 1896, Napoleon Bonaparte had also uh, commented in the context of Bank of France that uh, I want the bank to be in the hands of the government but not too much. That means that could because the Reserve Bank or the Central Bank of many countries actually are uh, owned by the government and that's where the profit of the Reserve Bank of India goes to the government and uh, however when Napoleon Bonaparte says that although it should be in the hand of uh, the government but not too much. That means there should be some elbow room uh, for the for the commercial for the central banks or for the Reserve Bank of India. And now when we uh, uh, discuss the autonomy about independence of the central bank, we should understand what is the central bank independence at all. So uh, when we talk about the independence, there could be actually uh, three uh, dimensions. One is that uh, the personal matters, basically the, uh, the people who are working in the Reserve Bank, uh, the board of governors, all those things. Then financial aspects and then uh, conduct of the policy. So we are going to discuss everything in details. Now coming to the personal matters, uh, it actually depends basically, you know, we can actually assess the autonomy of the Reserve Bank by looking at the extent to which the government distances itself from appointment, term of office and dismissal procedures of top central bank officials and the governing board. So in context of uh, India, actually we will see that uh, how the government uh, uh, you know, appoints the RBI governor or the deputy governors and then how whether they are dismissed in between or not and how in the recent context we can see uh, the appointment uh, in the monetary policy committee who are all appointed whether the government is appointing good people or not whether the government is interfering too much into their activities or not so e usually you know we will see that in context of India actually RBI ha you know, government has not actually intervened government has never actually suspended any RBI governor and uh, uh, so we basically you see that every RBI governor completes the term and uh, and uh, then only new governor is appointed. Similarly, we have seen the first monetary policy committee which has been appointed recently and which completed the first term of four years and then uh, new members have joined in the MPC. So uh, we see that good people are selected, it's not that political representatives are going into that. So basically, uh, so we can see actually that how uh, the autonomy is maintained in case of the personal matters. And uh, the extent and nature of representation of the government in the governing body of the central bank also would determine if there is too much of political representation in the governing body of the central bank, then we can say that there is too much independence. But I don't think that that has happened in context of India. Now the second uh, matter uh, dimension is the financial aspects and that is basically the freedom of the central bank to decide the extent to which the government expenditure is either directly or indirectly financed by the central bank credits. Basically, uh, government, uh, when government of India tries to borrow actually or uh, finance its uh, uh, deficits, it can either actually borrow from the market through RBI or it can ask the RBI to print money. Now, the autonomy of the RBI actually well, depends actually the freedom of the central bank to decide uh, the extent to which the government expenditure is either directly or indirectly financed. And uh, we will discuss actually how there is a limit has been put uh, uh, on this. Now direct or automatic access of the government to central bank credit would naturally imply that monetary policy is subordinated to fiscal policy. So that means automatic. Uh, uh, monetization of deficit should not happen. If that happens, then we can say that fiscal policy is over dominating, dominating over the monetary policy. So, 
that is second dimension and then third dimension is the conduct of the policy that is basically the monetary policy uh, as per the recent rbi amendment act that is 2008-16 rbi act has been amended and uh, uh, in that the rbi has been given a single mandate of uh, inflation target and uh, rbi has only the uh, monetary policy duty and or of course we can say that there are other uh, but mostly actually it is the monetary policy and uh, how uh, whether the RBI has been given the flexibility to the central or the, the flexibility given to the central bank in the formulation and execution of the monetary policy is there or not that also we have to see so those three things actually one is uh, the personal matters then uh, the financial aspects and then conduct of policy would determine basically uh, how if you look at all these indicators we can say uh, whether uh, the RBA, uh, the central bank of a country is really enjoying autonomy or not. Now, if you look at the literature, then uh, uh, the recent literature, there are two other type of independence uh, discussed. One is the goal independence, that means the central bank itself can choose the policy priorities of stabilizing output or prices at any given point of time, the setting the goal of the monetary policy. So whether RBI decides the goal or the government decides the goal of the RBI. If you look at the present scenario, then the monetary policy committee has been given a target uh, to control the inflation of by 4 percentage plus or minus 2 percentage. So goal is not flexible for the RBI. But instrument, if you look at the, the second uh, independence that is discussed is the instrument independence. And uh, uh, that means the central bank is only free to choose the means to achieve the objective set by the government. And in India, we see that RBI has the instrument independence, not the goal independence. And that is basically RBI can choose which tool to be used, whether it is repo rate, reverse repo rate, bank rate, or marginal standing facility rate, or cash reserve ratio, or statutory liquid ratio. So all these things are determined by the uh, bank. So you can see that RBI has the instrument independence, but not the goal independence. And uh, then again, there are uh, three different theories, you know, uh, are provided in context of uh, uh, basically the benefits of the autonomy of the RBI. And uh, so in that context, actually, we see uh, that there are three theories. One is the dynamic or time inconsistency theory, theory of political business cycle and theory of public choice that would explain um, the interference uh, in the RBI activities. Now coming to the first one, uh, that is time inconsistency theory, which basically says that the time inconsistency arises when the best plan currently made for some future period is no longer optimal when that period actually starts. For example, we have seen that monetary policy committee has been given a target of uh, inflation target of 4 percent is plus minus Two percentage, and that uh, will be applicable for five years. But then uh, we are keeping a target for coming five years, but we do not know what is going to happen in coming five years. Situation could be completely different. Look at COVID-19; nobody knew what would be uh, such kind of situation would arise. The economy would go through such a recession. So when we fix such a, uh, such a target, actually, we do not know what will be the future and when the time starts for the policy the situation will be completely different so it would be basically inconsistent time to is called as time inconsistency and there are incentives for a politically motivated policy maker to try to exploit the short term trade off between employment and inflation and uh, basically expansion and monetary policy may uh, produce higher growth and employment in the short term which will be liked by the policymakers. And uh, in the long run, however, such expansion and monetary policy will necessarily lead to higher inflation with uh, uh, deleterious, uh, deleterious uh, consequences for the economy. So political policy, if political motivated policymakers uh, adopt or push for expansion and monetary policy, the, that would be that would look uh, beneficial in the short term. But in the long term, this should be detrimental to the economy. And uh, then the solution could be that uh, the uh, RBA or the central bank should adopt a conservative central banker approach. That means the tightening monetary policy.
policy. If the fiscal authority adopts a expansionary fiscal policy, uh, the solution could be that the monetary authority adopts a conservative uh, uh, central banker approach. And the optimal contract approach would be, uh, no, basically the optimal contract approach would be between uh, the central banker and the, and, the, and the government. They should uh, sit together and uh, they should uh, talk to each other and find out the solution. And uh, uh, if you look at the different banks, then it US uh, uh, basically adopts a conservative central bank approach and New Zealand is a follower of the optimal contract approach. Basically, in the optimal contract approach, they both monetary policy and fiscal fiscal policy, uh, basically our monetary authority and fiscal authority, uh, chuck out the path to follow, and they stick to that. Actually. And the New Zealand basically follows the optimal contract approach. And the second theory is basically about political business cycle theory. It basically studies the interaction between economic policy decisions and the political considerations. And uh, uh, the best known uh, the the best known prediction of the theory is that the business cycle basically mirrors the timetable of the election cycle. And uh, basically, we see that there is a tendency of the incumbent governments to generate pre-election booms through expansionary fiscal policies. And once the incumbent gets uh, re-elected, the policy priority could change towards inflation control rather than employment generation. So we see that basically just with re-election a lot of new schemes are announced so that people get a feel that the government is doing a lot of things, a lot of welfare measures are taken over the government. That could actually put an uh, inflationary pressure but the politically motivated government fiscal authority would not actually mind that. But once they come back to the power or a new government comes to power, uh, that would there would be always an inflationary pressure on the economy and that time priority would be basically to control it. Uh, and not actually basically um, expansion of this purpose. But again, when they serve for the top term and then when they are ready to face the election, then again they will adopt another expansion of fiscal policy. So that is a uh, that is a political business cycle theory. And then the third one is the theory of public choice. Basically, public theory of public choice is basically uh, it, uh, the fusion of the politics and the economics. And uh, uh, so as for these actually, you know their public choice basically that there should be a constitutional amendment for a pre-specified stipulation on central bank credit to the government. Basically in, in, in India as we see that now um, the RBI has been given uh, basically the uh, both the government of India and the monetary authorities they have come into an agreement and they have specified the stipulation of the central bank uh, credit uh, to the government and unless there are constitutional or institutional constraints to the contrary, the democracy contains a bias towards the deficit banks. So we can see that there could be actually uh, 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 bias towards deficit finance. So there should be a limit actually, and there should be constitutional demand. Now the people who do not support the idea of uh, the autonomy of the RBI, they would argue that an independent central bank basically lacks democratic legitimacy because the RBI governor is not an elected representative. Uh, but so that's how the RBI governor is not accountable to the people or the monetary authority is not accountable to the people. However, the fiscal authority uh, who is basically elected government that is accountable to the public. That is why people say that uh, an independent central bank lacks democratic legitimacy. That's how it has to be accountable to the government because ultimately everyone should be accountable to the public. And uh, but this argument actually basically comes from the Milton Friedman statement that Money is too important an issue to be left to the well, to the whims of the central bankers. So we cannot leave it alone to the central bank. Rather, the elected representative or the elected government should interfere. And uh, independence may lead to friction between the fiscal authority and monetary authorities. So there has to be better coordination between the fiscal authority and monetary authority. And there may be significant divergence in the preference pattern of independent central banks and the society at large. So if we leave the RBI, uh, the central bank uh, uh, independent, then there could be divergence of reference pattern. So that's how there should be better coordination and complete autonomy of RBI is not, or the central bank is not also liked by 
a group of uh, people or a group of uh, intellectuals. But the pragmatic approach would be that uh, reconciling adequate independence with appropriate accountability. So, too much of autonomy is not required. Uh, there should be a reconciliation of adequate independence with appropriate accountability. So, RBI should be given some autonomy, but there should be accountability. Similar to fiscal authority should have uh, you know, also some accountability. And uh, to ensure that the central banks are uh, responsive, uh, to, to basically ensure uh, and this will ensure that the central banks are also responsive to the societal concerns like employment uh, growth and, uh, and price stabilization and also uh, inclusive um, uh, measures are taken. And uh, now coming to the measures uh, of independence uh, and how to measure, uh, how to assess whether central banks are you know, uh, autonomous or enjoying autonomy or not. It's a difficult term, you know, if you compare the central banks across the countries, it's too difficult because we do not have a clear cut indicator. And many people look at the legal independence, uh, mostly in the industrialized worlds. They see what kind of legal provisions are there uh, for the autonomy of the RBI. But uh, people have tried actually to develop indices to measure the autonomy of the central banks, but the existing indices are incomplete. And uh, if you look at the literature uh, on the central bank's independence and the economic performance, then we see there is an inverse relationship between the central bank independence and the level of inflation. That means higher is the autonomy, lower is the inflation rate. And there are lower the autonomy, higher the inflation. Uh, so there is evidence of negative cross-country correlation between average inflation and the degree of central bank uh, there are, of course, significant uh, measurement problems relating to central bank independence and uh, central bank independence by itself cannot ensure monetary policy's credibility, which uh, to an extent depends on the overall credibility of the government policy as a whole and appropriate division of responsibility between the monetary authority and the fiscal authority and the policy coordination is important. And there is a need to articulate the division of responsibility and policy priorities to the economic agents. Now, coming to the Indian scenario, we see that uh, uh, RBI was basically the, the legislation to set up RBI was introduced in January 1927. However, the enactment was made after seven years, that is in March, 2000, March 1934, and that's how RBI was set up in 1935. And uh, uh, so, when you see the life of the RBI and you try to understand the autonomy, then you can divide uh, into three different phases, four or five phases. Now coming to the first phase, that means initial years after uh, the setup of the RBI from 1935 uh, uh, to 1948, that you can see that the initial years are the infancy years of uh, uncertainty. Uh, we see that RBI was definitely uh, subservient to the dictates of the government. So whatever government wanted, RBI was basically fulfilling those objectives of the government. So it was fully controlled by the government, we can say. And in the second phase, basically, we see that in 1940, the uh, central bank uh, or the RBI was nationalized uh, from, and earlier it was a uh, stakeholders uh, bank, uh, uh, basically it was a stakeholders bank uh, and then that was nationalized. Uh, in 1948, that's how in 1949 we got the RBI the Regulatory Act. And uh, so from 1948 to 1960s, we see that uh, this is a maturing phase of the central bank or RBI. And so nationalization of RBI happens, and then uh, that was uh, characterized by a good degree of fiscal uh, rectitude and harmony in monetary and fiscal policy with areas of potential conflict being minimal. And the inflation rates were also quite low. And RBI uh, was vigorously involved in promoting the institutionalization of credit to agriculture and industry in pursuant to the overall objectives of the respective fiber plants. And uh, promotion and mobilization of savings by reinforcing the foundations of the banking system. So RBI was basically you know, growing and then it was creating different institutions to promote saving and to institutionalize credit. And overall, there was low inflation, so there is a good phase, of, and there is less conflict between the fiscal authority and and the uh, monetary authority. 
between 1948 to 1960. And then during 60s, we see the governor Iyengar uh, identified as a core area as a potential conflict between the bank and the central government. And those are basically our interest rate policy, uh, the deficit financing, the cooperative credit policies, the management of uh, substandard banks. And uh, the mid 50s uh, also uh, saw the beginning of the erosion of the autonomy in the monetary policy functions due to the emergence of the system of the ad hoc treasury bills and automatic monetization. So gradually we see you now from uh, mid 50s, um, the ad hoc treasury bill actually was introduced and that's how we see automatic monetization actually happens and that's how gradually the uh, erosion of the autonomy of RBI happens. And then it was agreed that RBI would replenish government's cash balances by creation of ad hoc treasury bills in favor of the RBA. So uh, in the third phase, we see you know, when in, in third phase, the nationalization of banks actually happens. You know, all the commercial, many commercial banks were nationalized. And uh, so there was a basically dominance of the government. In the third phase, we see a lot of dominance of the government and government became owner of a number of banks. And uh, but the supervision of these banks was uh, conducted by the Reserve Bank. And uh, so, and both are owned by the, so the regulator is owned by the government, and the banks are also uh, owned by the government. And uh, for each access of market uh, borrowing, the interest rates were administered, and the statutory liquidity ratio requirements for the banking sector were periodically high. Basically, to to ensure the borrowing of the government, uh, the statutory liquidity ratio was kept very high so that the government can use those money for its own benefit. And to neutralize the effect of the monetization of the price, monetization of the deficit on the price level, the RBA in turn had to intermittently increase the cash reserve. So basically to reduce the money supply through the multiple credit creation, RBA used to control the cash, uh, basically increase the cash reserve. So, so as a result of which, uh, due to high SLR and due to high CRR, the bank's profitability was severely impaired. So, it is because of the dominance of the government in both administration government owned the banks and government also owned the regulator that is the bank so there is too much of government or dominance with during this third phase and in the fourth phase that is start that starts from 1991 when we implemented the uh, new economic policy or the liberation privatization liberation policies were adopted that is the fourth phase, fourth phase starts and that also shows uh, a change in the idea there is a paradigm shift in both fiscal policy and monetary policy and the genesis of inflation targeting framework which will starts there and around the world there is a change in the minds uh, in the policy regime and uh, then during this time actually uh, an agreement was basically made uh, between the government and the RBA in September 1994 on the abolition of the ad hoc treasury bills uh, to be made effective from the 19, April 1997. So government and RBA came into an agreement and they made a deal that uh, there could be, there would be uh, basically abolition of the ad hoc treasury bills okay? and uh, that happened uh, uh, the abolition of ad hoc treasury bills happened in April 1997 but the agreement was done in uh, September 1994. So this basically eliminated the automatic monetization of the government deficits and uh, this resulted in considerable moderation of the monetized, de monetized, monetized deficit in latter half of the 90s. So uh, there is a limit. Now basically we are moving towards a, a rule based uh, monetary policy but not fully. And then if we look at the present status then uh, now both the fiscal authority and the monetary authority are following a rule based fiscal policy and rule based uh, monetary policy. Now coming to the rule based fiscal policy now there is FRBM that is Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. Now as per this act uh, the central government should keep the revenue deficit at zero level, fiscal deficit within three percentage. Uh, same thing actually is for the state governments. And uh, state governments are asked to maintain revenue surplus and the control fiscal deficit within three percent of their GSTP. So states are following uh, a, a, a rule based fiscal policy so that uh, the borrowing uh, limit is set. Similarly, okay, there is also a limit set on the borrowing requirements, how much central government can borrow, how much state governments can borrow. So there is a limit for everything. And uh, so it's a rule-based fiscal policy. That means 
uh, the crowding out effect will be will be also less because when government borrows too much, then market will not be able to get uh, capital, and the, the interest rates will also be higher. So uh, when the government borrowings are limited, then market can also get capital uh, from the market, and interest rate can be also at lower level. So you can say that now there is rule based fiscal policy, and uh, so the fiscal authority will not ask the RBI governor to print unlimited money or to borrow unlimited. And uh, at the same time, now the central bank is also implementing different international financial standards like Basel norms, and uh, so it has to fulfill the criteria of international financial standard. And then in 2016, we saw the RBI uh, Act was amended, and again here. Uh, RBI was given the mandate of controlling inflation, that is inflation targeting, 4 percentage plus minus 2 percentage. And the Monetary Policy Committee was constituted, which will be in charge of this, uh, basically controlling the, uh, uh, in targeting the inflation. So that becomes a rule-based fiscal policy as well as a rule-based monetary authority, monetary policy. And uh, now we see that during COVID-19, however, uh, now the fear of recession is, is looming large and uh, that's how uh, everyone is worried about uh, the growth uh, you know, forecast. So uh, here we see that uh, uh, the central bank has gone beyond the mandate of the narrow mandate of the inflation targeting. Because uh, at present now in the month of October 2020, we see the inflation rate has exceeded uh, the target that is 4 plus minus, plus minus 2 percent. That is so it has exceeded already 6 percent. It is more than 7% inflation now. However, the uh, Reserve Bank in its recent monetary policy announcement uh, has not increased the repo rate or uh, of other policy rates, uh, or it has not increased the interest rate to control the inflation rate. Uh, because now the priority has shifted from inflation targeting to growth, to, to basically uh, to attract the investment, uh, the private investment, the interest rates are being kept low by the monetary policy authority so that economy can revive quickly. So, so what we see in India is that there is a better coordination between the uh, central bank uh, and uh, the monetary and the fiscal authority and uh, that's what we also study in theories that it is only the, uh, the better coordination between the fiscal policy and monetary authority uh, results uh, uh, basically, the best uh, gives the best best outcome for the economy, be it in employment, be it uh, price control, or uh, basically stabilization of uh, output, uh, price, and employment. And uh, so that's how the Indian scenario is in a much better situation. And you can see that the economists like Joseph Stiglitz have appreciated the coordination between the fiscal authority and monetary authority in India. So uh, that's all I would like to say, uh, although in between there has been conflict on the autonomy of the Reserve Bank, we can say that the situation is much better and things are in, in a much better situation. So this is the reference for this. I have uh, referred the lecture given by Dr. Vaibiridi then, who was the Deputy Governor. Uh, he had given a lecture at Indian Institute Management Indore on October uh, 3, 2001, but however, I have updated the information to the recent day, years. And that's all I would like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you.